Okay, folks, let, let's go ahead and, and, and start. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to the uh, Fraser Lecture Series for 2012. Uh, I am Jim London, Associate Dean of the College of Architecture, Arts, and Humanities here at Clemson. Um, and um, uh, again, I want to, to, to welcome you to, to uh, this lecture series, which is put on by the Richard H. Pennell uh, Center for Real Estate Development. Um, I want to recognize uh, some of the members of the audience uh, tonight. Uh, the uh, Advancement Board for Real Estate Development uh, is a group of close to 30 individuals who do a great deal to uh, support uh, the program and provide some uh, external expertise. Uh, I know we have some in the audience that I recognize. Would those members please stand so that the audience can recognize you? Oh, come on. There we go. Thank you. We, we appreciate your support. Um, there are also in the audience a number of, of students uh, from the Master in Real Estate Development program that is now in its eighth year and has become one of the premier programs of its type in the country. Uh, students in the audience, as well as alumni, please stand and be recognized by the by the others. And then finally, the faculty and staff of the program that put in uh, uh, a great deal of time and effort to the program uh, to make it work. Will uh, those individuals please stand and be recognized? Come on. Okay. Um, the lecture series um, was established in 1992 with uh, 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 support from friends and colleagues of uh, Charles Fraser. Uh, Fraser. Charles Fraser was uh, a true visionary in the uh, area of real estate development. Unfortunately, he died in a boating accident in 2002, uh, but this lecture series uh, goes on in his uh, memory. Um, Again, Charles was a true uh, visionary. Uh, he substantially changed the way that we think about uh, master plan resort communities, uh, the design with nature approach that he incorporated uh, in sea pines uh, that carefully inventoried and protected natural features, uh, that uh, built houses and mixed um, um, facility, mixed use facilities that blended into their surroundings. Um, that used creative um, uh, deed restrictions and covenants to, to promote uh, high quality uh, design. Uh, these um, features uh, were replicated in other facilities around the country, uh, but sea pines, became, sea pines became the model uh, that was replicated elsewhere. In addition to uh, building uh, significant communities, um, uh, there was a great deal of talent that came through Sea Pines. Uh, Charles hired the best and brightest young designers and, uh, and business professionals of the day, individuals that went on to uh, be industry leaders in their own right. Uh, each, of these speaker, each of the speakers in this series has been part of, of, of uh, what might be referred to as uh, Charles's Disciples or Char Charlie's Angels. Um, our speaker tonight is one of those uh, individuals. Uh, I had a chance to run across Diane Parmar. Uh, it, during the early days, uh, she was with Sea Pines and at Kiwa Island um, and um, was very much involved in the activities that took place there. Uh, Kiwa, in many ways, took uh, the Sea Pines approach to uh, a new level with a very significant uh, uh, resource inventory and master plan. Um, Diane was very much involved in that process, uh, bringing her expertise in terms of strategic research and analysis and hands-on marketing. She has, in addition to Sea Pines and, and Kiwa Island uh, development um, uh, uh, experience with St. Joe Company, uh, and Daniel Island Company, as well as extensive consulting experience. Diane is a graduate of the University of Michigan, 
uh, and has been act an active member of the Urban Land Institute, serving as a ULI trustee and as chair of the Recreational uh, Development Council, as well as a member of a number of ULI award juries. Uh, please help me welcome Diane Permar. That introduction makes me feel kind of old. <laughs> Hi, Bogue. <laughs> Didn't see you earlier. Um, good evening, and thank you for that introduction. Uh, I have to say, when Elaine called and asked me to do this, I, I was pretty much overwhelmed and, and frankly, hesitated um, to, to say yes. Um, to follow, uh, starting with Harry, Harry Frampton, uh, then Jim Chafin, then Peter Rummel, then Ron Terwilliger, uh, three former chairs of ULI and the current chair of ULI, is kind of heavy <laughs> and made me a little nervous, uh, quite frankly. Um, all three of those guys are friends of mine. They're business associates. Um, they're all Charlie's Angels. Um, and um, when I, when after Elaine asked me, I called them and said, um, so do you think I can do this? I mean, please tell me if you, think it, if you think it's a mistake. And they said, Charles would be really, really upset with you if you wimped out and, and didn't have the courage to, to speak on, in his behalf. So here I am, um, and they're right about that for Charles. And I am honored, really deeply honored to be here. Um, my career in real estate began with the Sea Pines Company, and it began in 1974. And even after all these years, and that's a lot of years, I can't even do the math anymore, um, I still have clients and friends and important, really important relationships to me that were a result of that stint with the Sea Pines Company. I've spent really my entire career um, in, in what some might say is a narrow part of our industry um, in community development and in market analysis, market research, strategic uh, business planning uh, within that realm. Along the way, I worked for development companies um, and started several operating companies, and, and that was, those were great experiences, um, and have had this consulting entity that I, that I now am president of um, for a long time now, for about 25 years. After Charles passed away in 2002, um, there were, and all of the, how many of you go to ULI meetings? How many of you have been involved in ULI? Yeah, all of you. Well, you know all the lessons learned um, sort of panels at ULI, and I participated in a bunch of those lessons learned from Charles Frazier panels. And, and my list was always about research lessons learned. Uh, because they certainly couldn't compete with those guys I just went through for the, all the other lessons learned. Um, and what I came to understand is that those weren't just research lessons. Those were really life lessons. And um, they're lessons that I have carried with me my entire um, career. Um, I've talked with students in real estate programs a whole bunch of times. And often I start with sort of this list of lessons learned from Charles, um, a mentor and a friend for, for more than 30 years. And that, those of you that are coming tomorrow to class, I promise I won't do this again tomorrow. Um, the first one is read everything, especially what others are not. And Charles read everything. And, and those, those that knew him, it was an unbelievable list of things that he read, everything from red herring to red book. Um, and he would have loved, so loved, to be able to Google. <laughs> um, he taught people to observe people and places really with great care. And those observation skills were really high in, in him, and he encouraged them in all of us who worked with him. Share your knowledge freely. You'll learn more than you teach. And I certainly believe that. Um, Intellectual integrity is the very heart of research. And intellectual curiosity will keep you young. And it did him um, until the very day he passed away. 
So I want to start this evening by sort of talking about some of Charles' unique gifts in a really personal way. Um, and this, this talk might be too personal <laughs> for this group, it occurred to me, but it is personal to me. So um, I, I, I want to talk about his gifts in a really personal way. He really did bring to the industry a new development form, the master plan community. Um, that was, you know, others take credit for it, but if he wasn't first, he was second. Um, it, it is a, a whole form that didn't exist before Charles. Um, deed restrictions, community covenants, and this enormously heightened understanding of how to work with the natural environment to integrate the natural environment into community. Charles really um, took all of those things to a new level. But as you, as you mentioned, perhaps his most important contribution was really attracting and mentoring these incredible bright minds that really have been forever united. Um, it's one of the things that I look back on now and didn't realize at the time how important those relationships were at that time. Um, and they really have become the leaders of the community development industry for decades. Elaine sent me these DVDs of all the previous Charles Fraser lectures. Um, and because I'm a researcher and an over-preparer, I watched all of them and, um, and listened to all of them. Um, and I was really sort of surprised. There was one thing that I thought, well, gee, nobody said this. I could say this. Um, that, that I was surprised nobody mentioned. And that was the unbelievable youth of that group of people. I mean, obviously, you can't become leaders for decades unless you were really young when you started. So I wanted to share some of that. Um, I arrived at Sea Pines right after the peak, 1974, great time in, in the real estate industry. Not that dissimilar from arriving in sort of 2008. <laughs> um, not, a great, not great timing, right? Um, I was hired um, in a market research department that had 11 people in it. Um, a real estate company with a research department of 11 people. I don't think I've ever really run into one since that had that kind of presence or that many people. I was, a, I was 26 years old, and, and I was one of the experienced ones in the research department. I had more experience than anyone else in that, uh, in that 11 people. Um, Jim Chafin, one of the previous speakers uh, that that um, maybe some of you heard speak, who at that time was the senior vice president of marketing and sales for the entire company. There were, the company at that time was developing 10 master plan communities. Uh, he was 28. Um, and he was my boss, but he was my boss a couple levels up. <laughs> there were people between Jim and I when, when I first started there. Jim, Jim White, eventually Jim Chafin's um, partner in Chafin Light Associates that developed Spring Island, Balsam Mountain Preserve, Snowmass originally, um, was the CEO and president of the company, and he was 32 years old. Um, Charles was only in his early 40s. So it, the incredible youth that was there um, is why the, these folks have been able to impact um, the community development business in the way that they have. No one told us we were too young to be able to do what we were doing. You know, no, no one told us we didn't have enough experience, and so we did it. I felt like everybody there had a Harvard MBA. I mean, that was probably the best education. I don't. <laughs> you didn't mention that, did you, that I don't have a Harvard MBA. It was probably the most highly educated group of, of development professionals in the country, and maybe still, maybe still, um, if you went back and research. Everybody seemed smart. Everybody was fast on their feet. Um, but about six months after I started there, uh, literally the financial underpinnings of the company sort of started to fall apart and did fall apart. Um, in 1973, I still have these two annual reports. Um, the 1973 annual report and the 1974 annual report. And in the 1973 annual report, um, there was really quite a PR, bold, you know, bold statements about being able to borrow 
I think it was around $250 million. I don't know if anybody in the audience knows the exact number, but that's my recollection, right around $250 million. That was really a lot of money back then. Um, it's still a lot of money, <laughs> but it was really a lot of money back then. All of that was tied to Prime, all of it. And in the next year, Prime went to double digits for the first time um, in, in the history of the country. So the company proceeded to you know, sort of get small. Um, every Friday, again reminiscent of some of the last three years, every Friday as the company contracted, there was a human resources guy named Dick Dye, appropriately named, and, uh, and Dick would come into the corridors in the corporate office building with kind of a hand, handful of pink slips um, and let a group of people go. Um, and one Friday, it was the market research department's turn. And I was let go. I was fired on a Friday. And um, I went, I, I'll, I'll never ever forget that day. And I went home, um, sat in my house, cried all weekend, cried and worried because it was, we had just bought our first house. My husband is an architect and a planner. We're both tied up into the same industry and we had just bought our first house. Went back for outplacement counseling <laughs> on Monday and Tuesday and was rehired on Tuesday to work on a new team that was being put together, a business planning team for the Kiowa Island Company. Um, but I never forgot, and not to this day do, do I forget, how that felt to be told that I didn't have a job. So whenever I've had to let someone go over all these years, I take that, <laughs> that feeling, that emotion, into those discussions with me. Because the company was contracting, I had access to all the top people. And believe me, I wouldn't have, at, given my position in the company, had the company not been contracting and had Charles Frazier not been just absolutely adamant about research. It was a love of his. And I often think that if I had joined the company in good years, in the good years, I would have gotten lost in all that talent. Um, and I would never have gotten to know Charles, and I would never have gotten to know Jim Chafin, or Jim Light, or Ron Twilliger, or Peter Rummel, or all, the pe or all of those people. And those are the people to whom I owe my career. Those are the people that I owe this passion I have for developing and creating community. And those are the people that I owe really having a great time in this career, for the most part, except for maybe the last two, three years, um, for the last 38 years. There were only a few female angels. I'm glad to see so, so, so many women here tonight. But Charles was really accustomed to strong women. And um, as I got to know Mary, his wife, and Laura Lawton and Wyman, his two daughters, later, I realized that, that they had had an enormous influence on a lot of Charles's <laughs> ideas. Um, Mary said, used to always say that he was pulling for us, and I sure had that experience my whole life. When Peter Rummel accepted his job at St. Joe to be CEO, um, the first thing he did was to hire Charles to work for him to help him develop a business strategy for a million acres and $600 million of cash that was sitting in the company at that time. And Charles um, called me and said, Diana, we're putting together this team of people. I'm, trying, I'm gonna help Peter put this team of people together, but he only wants people that can get there in like a direct flight. So, you know, I was in Charleston, that company was in Jacksonville. You can't fly from Charleston to Jacksonville. Um, I didn't know you could drive that quickly either. So, you know, I, I, my head was spinning and all, all I remember doing is sending, um, sending uh, Charles of fax, <laughs> that's how long ago it was, saying, I'll get there. It, you know, it's not a problem. I want a seat at that table. Charles got me involved in that company's endeavors, and our company worked on the St. Joe communities for the next decade. Um, and that, those kinds of relationships Charles had with many, many, many of his angels. I wish I could draw the network. I wish I could draw the tree. Um, someone ought to do that. Some student ought to do that as a project. Um, lots of times, Charles and I would drive 
to Jacksonville for those meetings. In fact, I would drive Charles because he was a really bad driver and his family worried about him um, driving down there. So, and it's a long drive. I would sort of meet him in Hilton Head. It's about three hours from there. Um, it's a long drive. And Charles talked the entire time. And I have to say those were some of the most interesting hours of my whole life because he, the breadth of what he knew, the breadth of what he understood um, was really, really broad. So a lot of times he'd talk about development and development issues and community issues and things that I knew something about, but lots of times he talked about these really obscure topics like the history of the New York subway system or uh, migration trends from Great Britain to the United States in the 17 and 1800s or river barges on the Nile River, or he had this idea for bicycle golf, um, and that was the topic of one of our trips. Um, he had such an incredible thirst for learning. And years later, when I met Roger Milliken, um, I, I was struck by that same kind of intellectual energy. Um, Mr. Milliken was well in his 90s at, that, at the time I met him, their brains just don't stop. They just never stopped. Um, during those drives to Jacksonville, and later Charles used to stop by my office all the time in Charleston, our, my office is in Charleston, and he'd just kind of show up and chat for a few hours, which was always, you know, hard <laughs> in a busy business schedule, but um, always worth stopping to do whatever I was doing to listen. And he'd tear stuff out of my books and my magazines, um, which also, what, also I, I actually didn't appreciate it, but it was part of his process of constantly taking ideas and reassembling them in unique ways. And I realized in those conversations, um, when, when Charles would start a conversation with me about some obscure topic, I realized that Charles always assumed that I knew something about what he was talking about. He assumed I knew. He'd always do that. And, and I have to tell you that that assumption, assuming that I knew, instead of assuming that I, that I don't, which is really, was really the truth, had a powerful impact on me. Because it made me want to know. It made me work harder to know. It made me work harder to be able to have better conversations with him because he was so brilliant. It also made me observe more carefully. He taught me how to have the courage to, to offer an opinion, even when that opinion was about something that might be out of my comfort zone. And anybody, I have a, a few clients in the room, know <laughs> that I'm never lacking for an opinion <laughs> about much of anything now. In a room, how he did that with me was in a room full of experts and people that were um, kind of intimidating if you went through you know, who they were and what their backgrounds were, he would simply kind of turn to you and say, well, Diana, what do you think? Or how would we research that? Or just in that open setting. So I got better and better at thinking on my feet, and I got um, also learned uh, pretty quickly to say, I don't know. And that was a really valuable lesson that I learned from him. He loved research, and he loved the power of knowledge. And I remember this kind of proud moment in my life when, when we were sitting in a, a meeting um, on the celebration project, Disney's celebration project, the bunch of people, and, and we were invited to go around the room, around the table like you often are, and introduce yourself. Charles introduced himself as Charles Frazier, market researcher. And that was a proud moment for me. At Charles's memorial service, Peter Rummel had used this absolutely perfect phrase when he said Charles's genius was his dual insistence on data and dreaming. I love that phrase. And I think he nailed it. I think that's who Charles was. For me, that's who Charles was. How could learning about why people do what they do, why they buy, why they want to live in certain ways, ever be dull? 
It always leads to dreaming about a better day, a better place, a way to make people's lives better. And Charles taught me to not allow the data to, to dictate my thinking, only direct my thinking. And that was a really important lesson uh, for someone who was really data driven. You know, I was a math major. I like data, but you can't give me too much data. I like crunching all kinds of numbers. But he taught me that that data wasn't that important. And he taught it to me in a really swift way. Um, when we were first working on the Kiowa project, he sent the, the, this team of people up to Myrtle Beach and, and wanted us to learn what we could learn, come back, you know, sort of integrate that thinking into what we were talking about. And when we got back, um, I remember this really well, so long ago now, and I remember it like it was yesterday, um, he grabbed me in the corridor of the, of the corporate office building and, and asked me to come to his office. I'd never been in his office before. And he wanted to ask me what we had learned. And you go in his office, and first of all, it was a total mess. I mean, it was just awful. And there were stacks of publications and books on both sides of his chair to the point where you, he really couldn't move his chair. And there were stacks of, of reading materials absolutely everywhere. Everywhere you could see, he had stacks of stuff. And, and um, he sa so he asked me, well, what did you learn? So in my great, you know, mathematical way, I spit out a whole horde of, stat of stats. I had stats, man. Um, and I was ready with those stats. And I told him about ADRs and how many hotel rooms there were and golf rounds and and, and, and. And I'll never forget him looking at me and saying, you didn't learn a thing. <laughs> um, he said, you know, you go back there in July. We had gone in February. <laughs> You go back there in, you, in July, I want you to watch people. I want you to sit and see where there's energy, where there is an energy, where people want to be, what, people, what makes people smile, what, what irritates people. I want you to go there for an entire week and just watch and listen and talk to people. And I did. That's sort of a duh. <laughs> um, but. I didn't know it until he taught it to me. And that, to me, is what listening between the lines is about. It's about seeing and hearing what works. From then on, I watched and I listened. And to this day, our firm doesn't do a proposal. You know, I won't meet with somebody about a project until we've walked it, looked at it, thought about it. Um, you know hopefully even put some boots on the ground and, and spent some time in the market. Um, people watching and listening and observing people, they tell us in their actions and words how they want to live their lives, what matters, and what doesn't. And it's the core of the market research role in community development, not numbers, people. And I do a lot of talks where the entire talk is about numbers, but not today, not, not in a lecture called the Charles Fraser Lecture. A Spanish um, graphic designer that my husband likes to quote said, chance really does favor the prepared eye. Love that phrase. And I would add the prepared ear as well. Um, watching and listening to people can really lead you to successful innovation. And, you know, if, if anybody doesn't believe that, you know, just listen to Steve Jobs when Steve Jobs talked about, um, about Apple and how, how they developed their product. He said, and I love this, you've, if, if you've been to any talk I've made, you've probably heard this quote because I love it and I say it over and over. Great products are triumphs of taste. And taste is a byproduct of study, observation, and being steeped in the culture of the past and the present, of trying to expose yourself to the best things humans have done and then bring those things into what you are doing. 
expose yourself to the best things that humans have done and bring those things into what you're doing. That's what I think Charles did. And that's what he encouraged all of us who knew him, who worked with him um, over a lifetime to do. What we learn from our research, from the basic research that we do, it sounds, it sounds pretty simple. It sounds pretty straightforward. But it points to how our communities, especially um, some of our new communities, sometimes f fall short. People simply want their communities to work for them. And they want them and expect them, and we should give them beautiful communities. In times like these, when the sort of bottom line thinkers, and I'm sure I maybe have some financial leaners in the audience, but I'm not picking on you. <laughs> but, but I believe that you know people place profit. Um, when any of those things get out of sync with each other, you end up with not as good a place. And right now, we're in a period where it's the bottom line thinkers that rule community development industry. And I think it's more important than ever that, that right now we understand what cu customers are thinking, how the Great Recession changed their wants and needs, and how we as an industry need to respond to that. People rarely talk about home and community in financial terms first. And does anyone ever say to you, you know, I live in this great neighborhood. They talk about how pretty their neighborhood is why they chose that neighborhood. And they talk about uh, home and community in emotional terms first, and then maybe later they'll say, and I got a good deal. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with a good deal. Um, but it's a long list of emotional, physical, and value criteria um, that sort of have to get integrated to make a, a decision that's as important as where I'll live and how I'll live my life. During the downturn, I've really been disappointed, quite frankly, that the first question we're asked um, when we, uh, just about, almost always in these days, were, well, where do the prices need to be? How far down do we need to move the prices? How much cheaper can we make the product um, so that it will sell? And what I would say is we often undervalue the stuff that people value the most. That long, winding, beautiful country road that goes down to the village at Palmetto Bluff um, is a great example. The Grand Oaks that frame that waterfront village, um, that, those elements are what, what those owners say to us when we talk to them were the most important factors in them buying there. It's what was there not all the facilities and amenities and, and things that we added to it. Now they're all good too. They're all really high quality. But my point is just that almost always we're asked what to build. And often what we try to say to people is what not to build and where not to build. Um, Listening between the lines is not confined to listening to customers, although we spend a lifetime doing that. Charles engaged and listened to smart people all the time. Some of the people in this room have already told me stories about sharing, sharing their intellect um, with Charles and him sharing his intellect with you. And Charles knew that diversity of thinkers really leads to better ideas. And while the development industry is becoming more inclusive, it's very male, it's very pale, and sometimes it's focused on more, it's focused more about what was than what will be. It, that's a challenge, but it's also such a great opportunity. That's the thing that gets me psyched about it every time I say that line. It's a really good opportunity. When I first joined ULI, uh, ULI's Rec Console, Recreation Development Console, was 1992, and I was the first woman on that console. So when I walked into the room, there was me and 64 men sitting in a hollow square. <laughs> um, I actually couldn't find the room and was a little late, so it was a little intimidating um, to walk in there. Um, 
and that was 1992, not 1952, 1992. One woman, 64 men. Now there are four rec consuls. There are four or five women on my consul, which is about 55 people. So yeah, there's progress in terms of that. Um, but I would say to you that development companies and service providers that really embrace, particularly women, but women and minorities, will have a huge competitive advantage going forward. Um, you know all the stats about women make 92% of the home buying decisions, and I could go through that whole list of stats, um, and, and, it, and they're true. Um, women really are the principal decision makers and contributors to community. How could we possibly plan, execute, market without their thinking integrated all along the way? You know, marketers are classically women. There are lots of women in marketing and sales. Um, so I'm sort of like, you know, in the old world, it was okay to be a teacher or a nurse. Um, you know, it's in, in, in um, real estate development in my generation, marketing and sales was the way in. That's where we were most often accepted. Um, but women think differently than men, and that's why we're so important. We're better, we are better at and all the studies show this, at integrating and connecting and, yes, listening than men. That connecting and integrating is what makes community. So my entire life, I've had these strangers and acquaintances come up to me and, and on planes and you know, cocktail parties, every place I go. People tell me their life stories. I'm not sure why that is, but it's just always happened to me. Sometimes it's a gift, sometimes it's a curse. It depends on the person and it depends on the story. But that's a huge asset in what I do. It's a huge, a huge asset in what I do. Understanding sort of differences in how men and women think are really critical to understanding why, how they make home buying and community buying decisions. And, and they think differently. I mean, if you read all the literature on this, it's astounding what we know now about how different men and women sort of intuitively are. I love one example, which is, you know, when women, when we're talking to each other and we nod, or we're talking to you and we nod, you know, we're saying, I hear you, I understand. That's typically what we're saying. You know, that's, we're encouraging you. When guys nod, when men nod, they're saying they agree. Now think about the differences in those two meanings and what happens in a marriage when you're, when you're having discussions um, and, and, <laughs> and how, how just that one, just understanding that one difference could mean all the difference in a real estate deal, a real estate sale, or I would argue even in keeping a, a good marriage going. Um, to the extent possible, we really conduct our research, especially our one-on-one -on -one research or chat groups or focus groups or those, that kind of research by separating men and women um, and because it helps us better understand why people are buying or want to buy what they do. We've probably um, tested hundreds of development ideas and development concepts over the years um, like that. And we find that often ideas resonate very differently with men than women. And then we have to figure out how, what, how is that decision going to work when you put them back together and they have to make that decision as a couple. It's very interesting work. Um, I, I love that work as much as any work that we do. For example, you know, large acreage properties, especially buried properties, but even on a water's edge, if it's a really large acreage, men, men see that as exclusive, private, you know, that's how they view it. Women often see it as, as really isolating and in some ways confining. And many women don't like the very thing that their husband um, loves in terms of that, that kind of property. Women almost always consider the entire family when they're buying, especially property, especially real estate, family, friends, they're a whole network of people. Um, and, and we do that particularly about community, but we do it about home, work, our clothes, <laughs> schools. It's just in your DNA. And that's, 
that ability to think from others' perspective is what that's about. It's sometimes called empathy, and it's really critical to community creation. Part of listening between the lines is sort of obvious, listening to customers um, but and what they want and how to make better communities. But listening between the lines, too, for me, is about learning from our clients and from our colleagues. And establishing and maintaining those relationships over all these years has really been key to our business success, but it's also really key to, to how I live my life. And you know, my, my clients, our business associates, are, are some of my best friends. You know? And we spend an enormous amount of time with, with those folks. And without taking time for a specific sort of attribution to who said what, because I actually thought about doing that, and then it took way too long, I, I wanted to give you my top 10, sort of my Letterman top 10 um, insights I've gotten from my clients over the years. So number 10 is, if you pay too much for the asset, nothing can bail you out. I love that one, and it is really right. Nine, location, location, location is important, but not as important as timing. Timing is really important. Eight, the more money you have, the less truth you hear. And I believe that one. <laughs> um, seven, positive thinking is contagious, so is gloom and doom. Six, insta instinct, gut feel are really based on experience. The more experience you have, the more likely your instincts are to be correct. Five, trust and mutual respect are rare and important components of development teams and of community. Four, community vision is never clear, clearer than it is at the very beginning. So it better be very, very clear <laughs> at the beginning. Three, knowing what really motivates people is critical to running a company or selling anything. And my hint, this is my add-on, is money and or price is rarely the most important motivator. motivator. Two, real estate value creation is mostly about vision, great design, natural beauty, certainty, and people who care. And number one, hence the topic of this speech, great leaders are great listeners. But the best community creation insights that we get really come from people living and working in the communities that we help create. And I just want to give a few insights from recent research that we've done with them. Um, one, one insight is just that we need to learn to trust the insights that people have when we, when we talk to them. We recently interviewed um, a bunch of young mothers in in a community that was being developed for very moderately priced homes. And frankly, the client assumed that, um, they, the, that these mothers would not have very, and I'll put this in quotes, sophisticated taste in terms of what they expected and wanted in the community. And that's not at all what we found. We found that these young mothers were savvy, they had great product knowledge, and they wanted what everybody wants. They wanted safe, secure communities. They wanted technology that works and works 24-7. Um, they wanted pragmatic uses of resources um, and convenience. And they wanted healthy food choices for their children. And that's risen higher and higher um, in, in the work that we do. Yeah, they, they might take their kids to Chick-fil-A, but these mothers actually drove 45 minutes once a week to the nearest Whole Foods store just to get healthy food for their kids. You know, that was a real finding. Um, and and it, ended up, it ended up formulating a cornerstone for this entire 5,000 acre community. Um, often developers and builders assume, I lost one already, <laughs> assume that people buy what they want. And so you, if you're talking to builders or you're talking to developers and sales are going really well, you know, they'll say, but Diana, you know, we're selling these things like hotcakes. And of course it is one indicator. But what we heard from these moms and what we often hear in the work that we do is that people aren't buying what they want. They're buying 
They're choosing from the options that we give them. And we can usually do better. These moms didn't want to live in neighborhoods where all the homes looked alike. Um, and the plan works better for cars than for people. Um, they didn't want to live in neighborhoods without parks and trails. Um, and they could articulate a host of planning and design um, sort of issues within the community that, you know, frankly, our clients and lots of design professionals assume they wouldn't notice, assume they wouldn't, they wouldn't see. If there's a silver lining in the Great Recession, from my perspective, one of them for community creation is that maybe the industry no longer assumes we know. Builders and developers are finally asking customers again um, what they want. Customers have been sort of in charge of their buying in almost every industry for a really long time now. But in the development industry, because it's, it's a long-term process, because there's lots and lots of money invested, um, because it takes so much, so many people to get a product to market. Um, it really has not been the case. I mean, we can kid ourselves about that, but it really hasn't been the case. And maybe now, because we don't think that we know anymore, um, they may, customers may become a consistent part of the conversation in community creation. We're working with a client right now, I'm so excited about this, that um, that obviously believes this, and they're creating a, an online participatory design process where they will get feedback from customers in real time, all the time, maybe too much, maybe overwhelming, um, but it's going to be really interesting, and, um, and that'll be up and running in a year or so. Irvine Ranch, during the downturn, spent three years and a million dollars on, on consumer research. And the result of that was selling hundreds of new homes, even in the downturn. And more importantly, they honed this process. It was a really creative process. We called up the research guy and list, listened to him talk to us about it. That was another thing I learned from Charles. He would call anybody and, and ask them anything. Um, Tom Stanley that wrote The Millionaire Next Door, Peter just, or er, Peter, Charles just called him up and asked him to come and talk to him about, about his conclusions. Well, we called up the research guy at Irvine Ranch, and he talked about this process that they went through with first doing the kind of work we do, but then integrating that work with having architects and planners and landscape architects, uh, the equivalent of sitting behind the one-way mirror, although they did it in a much more sophisticated way than that, um, and, and recycling the work until they finally got these homes that were targeted, very specific um, consumer niches, um, and that resulted in these great home sales. The other silver lining for the Great Recession for me hits pretty close to home, and that's that the research segment of our industry, I think, shares considerable responsibility for the downturn from which we are now climbing. Um, frankly, projected pricing, absorption, bottom lines, um, were simply not grounded in fundamentals. They just simply were not. And analysts sort of failed to question the sustainability and the sales trends that were observed. Um, you know, of course, intellectual integrity is critical to the research process. I mean, <laughs> it just is. Without that, um, it, you know, it, it, it's not worth doing. And while the best developers that we work with, some of whom are in this room, always value and always encourage us to give them the unvarnished truth. You know, many developers weren't like that, weren't like that, and won't be like that because they're optimistic by nature. You wouldn't do these large-scale communities if you, if you didn't have a really strong sense of optimism. We do see evidence now that due diligence and real research and, and research being held to a much higher objective standard has come back. And, and it'll be back for a while. It'll go away again, but it'll be back for a decade or so, maybe. 
Market research in many ways has gotten a lot easier in the last 30 years. I mean, I remember going, I hate saying this stuff because students always, I, I always visualize you looking at me like I have a typewriter strapped to my chest or something. But <laughs> I remember going to the Beaufort County Courthouse and actually literally copying down, you know, transactions so that I could tell someone how many things had actually closed. They wouldn't let you even use the copier, you know, that, that was like off limits. So I'd take these little cards in and copy down um, in, in the transactions. In those days, data collection had a lot of value, quite frankly, not now. Um, now the value add is really in culling information in filtering information, in knowing what's relevant, in knowing how it impacts a specific place. And the one thing that, that especially for the students in the room, um, I think is really important is that you just can't understand community. You just can't understand how people make community and home buying decisions from behind a desk, looking at a computer screen. You just have to have boots on the ground to translate all that data and information into understanding and knowledge and maybe even some wisdom. That's listening between the lines. You can't hear, see, experience, feel online. You really can't. And being there is absolutely everything. Being there is everything. We've worked on, with developers on second home and resort communities, high end resort communities for, for forever because you know, my start was in the Sea Pines Company. And we've listened and studied why those people that can literally buy things almost anywhere, um, why they buy, where, they, where they're buying. And, and yes, it's always about families gathering. I listened to Harry Frampton talking about that. That's, that I couldn't agree more and sharing experiences. And as Jim Chafin says, Jim always comes up with these really clever phrases, which I wish I could think of. Um, and Jim talks about putting up mason jars of memories. I love that phrase. Nature curtains. He comes up with all these wonderful phrases. Um, and it's about, it's about the natural beauty and warmer climates. But at the core, at the core, when you really talk to these people, they're searching for more meaningful lives. They are trying to find more depth in their experiences, not more breadth. Usually they have a lot of breadth in there. They're trying to find real meaning in their lives. I love the John Gardner quote, um, and, and I promise this is the last quote, but I love this one about meaning. Meaning is individually defined, and so it's really hard to translate to community development and, and, and cornerstones and those kinds of things that we all learn in school and talk about in our practices. But this is what real meaning is. Meaning, John Gardner says, is something you build into your life. You build it out of your past, out of your affections and loyalties, out of the experience of humankind as it's passed on to you, out of your own talent and understanding, out of the things you believe in, out of the things and people you love, out of the values for which you're willing to sacrifice something. The ingredients are there. You're the only one who can put them together in that unique pattern that will be your life. I trust that people know what they, how they want to live their lives and that they're working to compose meaningful lives one way or another. And I really want to end on that thought that really listening to people, really listening to people can change how we think about development. It can change how we think about community, about each other, about our world. And I believe that people know what they want. I assume they know just like Charles assumed I knew. Um, creating places and community development is a really complicated process. It's a really complex process. But at its best, it's really noble work. And it's work that, ha that requires the highest form of creativity. Um, community development requires great leaders like Charles and Peter and Jim Chafin and Jim Light and, and many, many other ch of Charlie's angels. But I believe a person can lead from any position in a company. And each of us can make a difference, if only just by listening. So those, that's my message, and I'll be glad to take questions.
You have to at least ask one. No questions. Well, gee, there's a simple question. Um, well, you know, it's just a given. I mean, I, I think, I think, um, you know, we, we, I, I remember going to programs, and Pete Halder and others used to talk about future-proofing our communities and all kinds of things that we do. I mean, I think where we are now is it just has to work. It has to work seamlessly, and you just have to keep evolving with it. Um, I, you know, it's. There are there are good and bad aspects about technology, but you know, to me, it's just it's just it's an ever present piece of our lives now, and it helps our lives work. The one thing I think it really does that is really here now that we've talked about for 20 years is people really can live and work anywhere now. They really can, um, and that really wasn't true when we started talking about it. Um, it was. It wasn't really possible to have a virtual company. It is really possible to have a virtual company now. And in fact, during the downturn, you know, many, many people have started you know, creating, you know, re reassembling people, people that no longer work for them but, but are, are independent contractors. And it works fine. You know, they can work out of their house. They can call in from wherever they are. Um, but I always, always think that the human connection, that the one-on-one, -on -one, that looking at looking someone in the eye, that seeing how what their body language is like, all of that will never ever lose its importance. So it, it you know it can't take over in that way. I don't know. You'd you'd have to ask someone else about all the social media platforms and all of that. That is not. I am not a tweeter or a Facebooker or any of those things. Um, but I know it's really really important. And, I, and in fact, in this particip participatory design process that we're working on, um, that is the entire platform. It is all done through social media. And it's, it's very, very cool. Um, it's not something I choose to do, but, it, but it, I just think it's, it's here. It's, what, it's, it's where we are. It's what, it's what, all, it's what all these students do. And, um, and I think it's here to stay. So I think it'll be a great tool. Um, once we once we really learn to use it, I in that process, our role in that process is to try to get the marketing people sort of out of the way a little bit, so that we actually get real information, real research from it, not just you know spin and you know numbers that really don't go anywhere um, for the community development process. So I'm ex I'm really really excited about that. Couldn't explain it to you, <laughs> but I'm really excited about it. Other questions? Yeah. Um, you said something that I thought was really interesting about um, people have been buying the best that we're offering as opposed to what they really want to buy. Um, and I'm curious your thoughts on you know, new urbanism and this kind of retrench back to urban areas. Do you think that's something that we're trying to sell to people, or do you think that that's what they actually want? Well, I. I think there are people that want that, and I think there are people that don't. Now, almost all, I guess, you know, a point I, I make a lot is almost always people ask me or questions, and almost always the answer is and. Um, and so, you know, people are really complicated, and there's a wide range of things that they want. I, what we most often hear is they don't have enough choice. They, they don't feel like they have enough choice. And of course, the lower price point you go, you know, the farther down market you go, the less choice they feel like they have. So you know, there are a lot of people that um, would buy, you know, I believe, and we hear them say, would buy in a better design, maybe make the trade off for a smaller home. But they're not offered that at the price points at which they're, they're shopping. They're only offered you know, the I love the billboards that say, you know, most square feet 
for the least amount of money. I mean, that's like that, you know, we won't pay for quality. I mean, there are people that will pay for quality at every price spectrum now, but there are also people who do want the most value, you know, do want the most square footage um, for their dollar. It's okay. We need to, we, as professionals, we need to make both of them good. <laughs> Look good, work, you know, not, not have sort of some things that work and some things that don't. Hey, buddy. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, something I've loved yeah. was a project that you worked on, mm -hmm. and I've had a chance to see you uh, see it. And what I understood was it was, it was the, the segment of Charlie's disciples that kind of took it and looked at it second generation. And you mentioned some of the material things about the O's and the drive and those kind of things, which are really strong as to why you probably chose that place. Um, how, how did... Uh, Um, well, you know, Palmetto Bluff, the, the land was purchased by, the, by Crescent Resources on um, the head of the residential division at that time was a guy named Tom Webb. He's a great guy. He's no longer with Crescent, but he, but, um, and he, I remember him coming to my office at, and saying, you know, I want to get somebody that really, really understands the natural beauty there, really understands the environment to lead. Um, that process, and he hired Jim Mosley to head up the company. And Jim Mosley actually is a land, was a landscape architect and planner by training, and um, was part of the Sea Pines group. Um, he he tells really funny stories about how you know what he did was like try to figure out where the boardwalks went. I mean, he was kind of like me. He was a worker bee. He wasn't a, he wasn't at a lofty level when he went there, and. And Jim um, certainly took the lead on that, um, and Hart Howerton was the planning firm that um, out of San Francisco. So it was Dave Howerton and Jim. Um, it's sort of a hard process to describe because what happened in that particular process is there were so many of us that had known each other for so long and worked together for so long. Um, I had worked with Jim at Kiowa and and and. Uh, you know, Bill Peacher was there. There were just a lot of old Sea Pines folks um, in that process that the communication was all shorthand. I mean, we had so many similar um, analogs in our heads and so many things that we thought we knew um, from other uh, experiences. But then we did really serious research on that project. We did really serious consumer research on that project. And, and some of the examples that I talked about, um, we listened to, you know, we'd invite couples to come to the property. And we listened to men talk about how they wanted one of these big homestead lots out here by the marsh or on the river. And then we listened to women say, you know, I'd really like to be in a nice little village, kind of like Buford, you know. so. Um, but but those guys really those the, you know it's interesting because there and at the same time some of the St. Joe communities were really driven being driven by people that really came from sort of the physical side of the business came from planning architecture and design and I think um, some of the best physical communities came about at that time and they wouldn't have been able to sort of lead in the way they, that that they were given sort of free reign, I think, in this period of time. You know, they, they, got, they got those reins because everything was up and to the right, and, um, and the cost parameters weren't questioned as strongly, quite frankly. So, you know, but it's a great, it, it, it is a great project. I'm sorry, buddy. Um, the lesson that you taught us today, Lauren, Oh. No pressure at all. Well, you know, I think that, it, that all of these things, you know, everything evolves kind of slowly. So I don't think that you get sort of these radical changes in real estate f fast. Well, you just don't see, I mean, in my career, 
it's usually been sort of an evolution of things that happens. Um, if I had to guess, um, I mean, I think there's, I think you've heard me say this before, I think that there are communities that are going to do really well as the economy comes back. And I think there are communities that are not going to do as well as the, when the economy comes back because I think there, I do believe that people's mindsets have really changed. And I, I think that you've got to be in tune with, and, and, and it's at every, that's not, about, that's not about socioeconomic level. That's about real learning that goes on in people's lives when they finally learn that resources are not limitless you know, that there are limits to resources and they've had to cut back and they understand all those things. So, you know, if I had to guess, I think that we'll see, um, particularly the recreational communities, I think, I think that, you know, the good ones will survive and will be healthy and will do well. Um, the others, I think, are going to have to morph into more either retirement or primary home communities and um, and in primary home world, you know, in, in, in people, communities where people live full time, um, I just think there's going to be a lot more range of what we see out there. I, I think it's going to be really, really hard to get large scale things done um, going forward. It's just going to get, be really, really hard to get them financed, um, to get people to believe in them. So, and I think that could be a good thing. <laughs> Because I think sometimes the large-scale projects um, were planned in a way where you just felt like they were going to go on forever, as opposed to planned in a way where this makes sense. You know, if only the first five years gets done, if that only that part of the project gets done, it's going to feel really good and work really well. You know, instead of this, all of this, this 30 years of development has to get done before it really feels complete. So I think, I think there are some real lessons that everybody's learned, always do, in, in tough times that, that we'll see spinning out. But I do think there's a lot of innovation that's going to come out of this. You know, builders are finally looking at real green um, techniques. Builders are, and developers are, are being pushed in that direction because people believe energy costs are really going to go up finally, finally, finally. Um, I think we're going to see that in much, much bigger numbers than we, than we used to, than we have, you know. I'm sorry. Day. No, no, you've done wonderful. <laughs> Absolutely excellent. Thank you so much. Oh, you're more than welcome. You did a great <laughs> job. Thanks, my pleasure. What is this? You did a stellar job, so I thank you Thanks. very, very much. For you're more than welcome. I did want to recognize a few people in the room that um, I don't think they were here originally. We've got our, our chair of the School of Planning Development, Preservation, and Landscape Arch Architecture, Dr. Tom Church. He joined us about a year and a half ago now, so um, he's here. I'd also like to let people know these, the students here have had a very, very long day. Some of them started at 8.30 this morning with a technology class. Then they spent an, uh, about an hour with some great alumni speakers, and that panel is organized by Laura Hazleton, who's the president of our student alumni, uh, our Clemson University alumni, oh, help me, what is it, Clemson? Alumni Association. So Laura Hazleton, please stand up. Thank you for organizing. Um, I also wanted to recognize um, Kate Graham. Kate Graham organized, for the most part, the career fair that, that was then held for three hours um, over at Hendrick Center. This was our first career fair for the, for the school, and I think it went very well. Ten companies. And those of you companies that are here, please stand if you're here still. We have a few of you are still here. Thank you very much. Oh, I don't know, but um, it really